coming from so far is just how much alike we are. And, um, and I think this is something that we're building on and continuing building on and I feel that I'm going to build on the presentations made yesterday and I'm going to build on, on the presentations made today, though I'm not going to play any games. Well, as you can see, we're going to build on. This should look familiar to you. Just point here was that, oops, sorry. I just wanted to mention where Peru was. We're here. Peru is here, and we're here at the other, so it's, oops, sorry. Getting tricky. Sorry, you can go back. Go back. Okay. So Peru is here, and we are here at exactly at the other end of the world, 12 hours difference in time, time zones, and the similarities are enormous. And uh, I'm just, um, I was, well, uh, you're going to recognize the presentation, the slide from Dr. Feng's representation earlier yesterday, and basically is because we are all countries at risk. And just see all these colored in orange, which are the colors that need to save more money to invest on future losses, to avoid future losses. And this means that we have to not only build resilience within communities, but advocate not only with top national authorities. So that's something that we do. Next. And just to make a big stress is I'm one of these persons that have got, has walked from the humanitarian response to disastrous reduction. Basically, after understanding that you, if you want to work on really long term, you can't be responding to emergencies on a yearly basis. And you really have to have a, a prospective view on what is happening, and you have to have a, not only um, good responses, but to have a prospective feeling and work on public policy. And here is where we begin bridging the areas from communities to advocacy, involving scientists and researchers on the road. And just to point out, Peru is a very, is a multi-hazard exposed country. We have the Pacific here that modifies the climate, and we have the Andean, and, the Andean highlands here and the Amazonian tropical forest here. We have over 100 life zones that makes not only a multi-hazard, uh, not only a multi-climate country, but a multi-hazard one too. So we have to think that we can't live without risks. It, we, we are risky, we're only highly risky, but we only have um, geological hazards due to the Andes, and we have hydromet that are only going to get worse due to climate change. So it's not that things are going to get better, it's things that are going to get worse. And this means that we have to involve public policy makers. And that is why, as practitioners, we walk from vulnerable communities to top high decision makers. Otherwise, we would not be able to, if we really want to have public policy in place. Next, please. And our challenge then is learn to live with multiple risks and change the, move the approach from victims to citizens. And that's, the, this is some of the pictures that we can see in Peru, not just earthquakes, cold freezes, and so forth. Please, next. And then, and again, you're going to find this, see this, and this implies combining sustainable development, uh, disastrous reduction, and at cl climate ch adaptation to climate change. So you have to work all these three lines of action if you really want to have something done and in the process. And that's exactly what the country has been doing in terms of working and 
we have priorities of action taken from the Sendai framework. And those priorities of action, as mentioned, are understanding disaster risk, strengthening governance, investing in disaster risk reduction, and enhancing preparedness. And this is basically for decision making. And decision making in, for the, in the sustainable development of territories where we have to combine adequate information, meaning that forecasts have to be suitable, adequate, and timely, communication, and this means not just having the information, but communicating properly so that people understand and, and take a really um, the way the language, who it is addressed to. It's not the same communication. You have to have uh, exactly good reports to make sure that people understand what you want to be said and an enabling institutional framework. And this is normally one of the weakest points. It's not just, and you have to combine these three addressed to different publics. And this because decision makers are not just top government officials, but also organizations, private and public, and families themselves. Families have to take action, and action will only happen if you have the adequate information, you understand what is being, what's said, what is being communicated, and you have an enabling institutional work, um, framework, meaning laws, regulations. Most of risk, most of people involved in risk has basically to to do with um, social construction of vulnerabilities, and that's where we have to work. It's no, uh, it's um, disaster reduction normally is not a popular activity, and it's not popular because it never gets any front pages. It's just doing the things right. Normally, humanitarian response and humanitarian actions do get front pages, and if you want to work with, sorry, decision makers, it's tricky. They'd rather, though they know they have to do good governance, of the, good governance and do things right, they're also aware they're not going to get any stories on the news. So it's this combining of what to do well and why and becoming, being, um, being on the press, which is important. And just to sort of express what is it we do in CARE, is that we have a community-based adaptation approach. And this means working with policy and practice on the one hand, but also having tools to work on local participative assessments. And here I wanted to stress that how important the fun approach is in communities to understand what is the, the communication is being passed on. People, vulnerable communities, they're normally poor, normally don't have time to have fun. So being able to understand what is being said, pass on the messages, and have fun in the process is really important for the messages to sink in. Otherwise, you're just gonna have the people sitting at the meeting, but not really understanding and, and what I mean understanding, meaning taking action in what is being said. And so uh, uh, appro appropriation and ownership are key lines of action if we really want to have changes in, the, in this. So again, that's the community-based framework that we normally use. And it has to do with the involvement of, of um, climate change on the one hand, uh, working on advocacy on the other hand, but using, working with risk and certainly at community level and working with top climate change knowledge updated. And this is, this is our challenge. In terms of what is happening in Peru, in terms of um, enabling institutional approach, we have a national risk manage policy, which is approved in 20 in 2011. And it's very, though it was approved before the Sendai plan of action, you're going to find there is a lot of big alignment. On the hand, one hand, you have to um, develop 
risk managed through a system, we have a national system in place, you have to strengthen capacities at the different national levels, meaning understand risk, the specific risks. There is nothing more specific in territories than risk. Risk is no, um, it, it's something that's very, very specific to the territory. It's not the same thing having a flood on a coastal desert than having a flood in the Amazon, than having a flood in the highlands. So alternative for flooding is not exactly the same. It has to be adequate for the territory. And again, so capacities have to be built at the territories where the ha hazards happen. And then, and this has to be involved in planning and resources. Political will is only really political will if it has resources allocated to it. Otherwise, it's just pure talk. If you don't have a budget line, if you don't have funds allocated, then it's not really political, political will. It's just being in the, in, the mo, in, the, in the fashion of what has to be said, but it's not really taking decisions or ownership in what has to be done. And then we, we need to have a culture of prevention and resilience capacities for sustainable development. Again, we're always talking on sustain, sustainable development, which means, which means mainstreaming disaster risk reduction and adaptation to climate change in the specific territories according to the specific needs and doing the specific actions. It's not an abstract. It's something very, very territorial, basic, and straightforward. And this is, again, how we've walked in the country, and this is not, a, it's also taken from the GAA report, how we have to work from, how we walked from emergency response which was the traditional way of understanding to the, the risk management, meaning understanding the risks before they happen and how to avoid their, um, their effects, or to, so as to mitigate, avoid or mitigate their effects. And for that, Peru has had an alignment, a national alignment, a strategic alignment for disaster reduction. On the one hand, there is a, a, a state policy related to disaster reduction, which is discussed in 2010, and it became compulsory in 2012. So every national, every member of the national government, at all level of governments, has to include uh, disaster reduction, has to mainstream disaster reduction in actually policies. Then we have a, a strategic national plan which includes, which mainstreams disaster reduction. There are, there are specific national plans and there is a national risk management plan that it involves activities and, 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 mod and monitoring pieces of indicators. And then we have at the sector level strategic multi-sector plans that again mainstream disaster reduction and strategic, strategic institutional plans and subnational development plans, again, with the disaster risk reduction approach. So this is something that's come nationwide at all levels of government and for all public offices that is being passed on to the private sector in terms of continuous um, continuity of services. And that's something that's very much stressed at the moment. And before, before I wanted to point out and make an experience that how we have been combining all, the, all this that I've been talking about. And this is, I'm going to talk about the Glacier Retreat Project, which is related to uh, practical action on what we're doing in the country. As I mentioned, this is the desert, this is the desert coast. These are the Andes, and these are the three Andes, Andean mountain ranges. And this is the Amazonian area here, with the cross, crossed by the Amazon River. And in the upper Amazon, you see these white spots. These are glaciers. These are glaciers. In Peru, we have 70% of the glaciers, of the tropical glaciers in the world. And what climate change is doing is that it's melting them down. So there's not only, there will not be, this is a solid water res reservoir that is being melted and disappearing slowly. So this project is, uh, is to help improve capa adaptive capacities and disaster reduction 
due to Glacier Retreat and to strengthen basically scientific, technical, social, and institutional capabilities of managing, of managing this problem. And for this, we work with, at the government level, basically with the Ministry of Environment, but also with universities, bilateral cooperation, and national universities. So this is just a, so it's again, it's a, an example of how we have to share information, share efforts, and work in partnerships. Uh, and why is it that we do that? From, we've had, at the moment, from, or more than 76,000 casualties due to the, pres to the events uh, resultant from a glacier retreat. So it's, uh, it's not just saving water, it's not just saving the environment, but it's also basically saving lives, assets, and livelihoods. This is a picture of glaciers in, of a glacier in the Andes in 1962. But, sorry, next pic, please. And this is a, re sorry, before, this is a recent picture see what, how the glacier has retreated. Not only is there no uh, snow, but all this is a lake at the moment. It's an enormous lake that spells basically smelted snow. And this, this lake here is just above an important city. So this can, if the lake can overflow and have an enormous avalanche on the city and kill half a million people. So this is what glacier retreat that is only increased by climate change can do, and this is how we relate climate adaptation measures with disaster reduction on the practical field. And for this, we work with, a, again, with a community-based approach, meaning how, do, with the, in this context, how do you reduce people's vulnerability and in and how you and it's only because you, people have to adapt and have to learn to live with the risk and have to know the benefits of having early warning systems and other and take early action on that. And again, and this is a struggle because how do people understand knowledge, understand risk, and that is a that is a challenge. It's not what people in scientific communities understand, that it's straightforward to what people really believe. We've, they've always lived there, they've always been there, they've always had hydromet hazards, and why should it be riskier now than before? And, and this is, oops, sorry. And this is a, a mess, this, so this has to be, we have to recover oral history, local practices, understand the, con people, the, the concerns of the local people in terms of risk, how do they understand risk and what do they think has to be done about it, and how do they perceive climate change. So this is something that do that's done at the community level to be able to, un to better understand what people are thinking, being able to prove um, experiences and build evidence so that policy and national policy can be made from this comprehension. And this means doing a lot of research. It's not that just you, you go, you have to do research and you have to be able to have a database and all that line of action here to be able to prove practical points. For instance, this is a risk map. This was the original risk map people had, and this is the updated one, and how risk has increased for vulnerable communities. And it's not the, just that you had a risk map built a few years ago, you can't use it with climate change coming on. It has to be revalued, it has to be va valued, validated, and revalidated and discussed at the communities to be able to understand the, cha the changes climate change brings. And again, this is a practical mapping of safe areas and evacuation areas for people to understand at communities. So you have to translate the scientific mapping using GIS to specific uh, hand, uh, um, 
handmade maps that people will be able to understand and use on a regular daily basis. And, and people have to understand that they have to be organized to face risks and face what is happening. And of course, for this, we use, in this specific case, we use early warning systems based on all the above said. And with, and this is how you communicate to the people, and this is where you have posters all over the town so people understand how the system works and what people have to do about the information that's passed on. It's not just that you have the scientific information of what needs to be done, it's how people have ownership on it and understand exactly what the, what we are propose, what the proposal is, the scientific side of the proposal is, and what is it they have to do, because action needs to be done not only at the authority level, but also at community level and at family level, especially to save and protect lives. And this is the drilling on, on early evacuation and, uh, and uh, on the risk of avalanches and floods. And th these are some of the challenges we face on the, our everyday work. On the one hand, that people that had lived in the Andes from pre-Columbian times, over the 1500s, um, they have been living with risk all the time. It's not that the Andean area is, is riskier now than it was before, because hazards have always happened. Include, uh, we can even say that some of the high pre-Columbian communities disappeared due to hazards in the past, but again, weather conditions are changing due to climate change, and this is a baffling experience for most, for most. Uh, sorry. As mentioned, Peru is one of the most vulnerable areas in the world, due, as a, and, but again, vulnerability is concentrated on the poor. And this is a way, a vulnerability, exposure to vulnerability is a way of increasing poverty. So again, working on adaptation and working on disaster reduction is a way of working on poverty alleviation. And this is one of the approaches. It has to be included, again, in sustainable development. You can't really continue development if you're not working and you're not mainstreaming disaster reduction and climate change adaptation. And again, to adapt, for the, you have to be specific on, on the life zones that have, have, and bearing that in mind, you have to be aware of what traditional knowledge is, is saying on the topic because it's, this, is really we, this is really deep in the people's knowledge and management. And you have to take, and then you have to bring, and again, provide first-hand clues of what's happening. It's not that you're going to have very theoretical initiatives. You have to really have very first-hand clues of what needs to be done and why. Again, yesterday's comments on what, where, and when are basic. You need to know that. You have to, you have, to have answers for that. And you have to facilitate the adoption of adaptive measures. And again, to be able to, and you have to be able to communicate the gap between, uh, bridge the gap between traditional knowledge and Western science and these have to be built. It's not that straightforward. It has to be built, it has to be understood. And for practitioners, we have to bridge in this uh, policy, bridge in the, the, and facilitate the communication between policy makers, scientists, communicators, vulner and vulnerable communities, okay? And we have some learned lessons on this. On the one hand that the people's um, measures have to be based on the people's involvement, involvement and identif identification. It's not that it's not that it's just that you say it. It's that they, people need to know, have to understand why, and they have to be involved. On the other hand, that you have to establish between project participants, technical sta sta uh, staff, and scientists to strengthen trust processes. Trust is essential. It just, it's not because the scientist says that the people are going to believe. You need to have built trust, and this is a, this is a very delicate process. And, and you have to be able to establish ownership within communities, not just among authorities. 
And normally, uh, communication is a key word. And for communicators, in the involvement of the media is also critical. It's not just that you have to be able to speak well. You have to involve media so that mass media is also understands what you're saying and is helping on the process, on the, on the comprehension process. And then you have to be practical about adaptive and risk management um, uh, measures. It's not that you can have something very technical or very scientific that's going to work. You have people need to understand the basics and for this, to this end, um, the presentation in the morning on the experience in, um, in Thailand is just exa exactly what I'm mentioning. People have to understand why and what, what and why, what needs to be done and why. And again, oops, sorry. And again, uh, the perception, the, you have to, I mean, the perception of risk does not necessarily lead to action. People really has to be a responsibility, you have to pass on responsibility and awareness, and that something needs to be done. Otherwise, it's just not going to be, otherwise it's not going to happen. And, and um, again, you want, and this is where, uh, policy this is with, with making policy starts is you have to have evidence-based pilot experiences. You just it's not that policymakers will believe that needs to be done because scientists says so. You have to see they have to make sure that this is going to work at the community level, that it's going to be understood, and it's a good and it's a good idea to do so. And this is this is that advocacy process needs to be thinking of sustainability all the time. And again, this is a sustainable development issue. And thank you very much. We have done quite a number of publications on different experiences related disaster risk reduction and adaptive measures. Most of them are in Spanish, a few are in English, and you can always check on the website and other media.